6 o'clock, and I got your friend uh, on the phone, Dr. Jose Williams, and let's see what's on his mind. Reverend? Yes, sir, Miss Annie Patrick. How are you? Lovely, lovely. He had a lengthy uh, list of driving arrests for whatever. Uh, God bless him. Party Supermarket is the place to go tonight to get you some beer and wine. The only hazard of that is you have to watch out for Jose. You have to watch out for him so that he don't run over you over there. While Pat would spend 10 or 15 minutes on the phone with certain people on his radio show, he would get on the phone with Hosea Williams and they would not stop. They would talk for a half an hour, an hour. Listen, I truly say that you have earned the right to be mayor of Atlanta or any other city. All I want to ask the people, please give me a chance. I have earned the right. I've stood up. I've spoke out. I've earned that child unbossed and unbought. Please give me a chance. And I remember one day, because I was working at the Georgia Network and listening to Pat, had the clock there. They talked for, I think it was an hour and 40 minutes without interruption. Again, no commercials, no records. I don't even know if they did a station ID. And certainly so, certainly no, no newscast from the white boys of the Georgia Network. Hosea Williams was a civil rights leader who was deeply committed to the struggle. He was a trusted ally and advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He founded Hosea Feet the Hungry and Homeless as a way of tackling the needs of the less fortunate in his community. And due to his contributions, a street in Atlanta was named after him shortly before his death. I am pleased to be joined in the studio with his daughter, Dr. Barbara Williams Emerson, to talk about the life and legacy of her father. Today, we remember Hosea Williams. He started from very, very humble beginnings. He was born in 1926, just prior to the real depression. And his mother was a single, blind, black young woman in her early 20s who was the daughter of sharecroppers. And she had gotten pregnant in a place called the Macon School for the Colored Blind in Macon, Georgia. So his father was also a, a blind young man. So he started from these beginnings literally dirt poor with a mother who was very disadvantaged who then actually died when he was 10 years old. So he had very little support, parental support he had very little income. He had access only to the basics of segregated education. He was in a rural setting. So he had a lot of factors that were working against him as a black man, a black child in the United States growing up during the Depression. What was it about his upbringing that piqued his interest in community activism? Well, a lot of it had to do with his experiences. He became a champion of the poor, a champion of the person who had no one to speak for, for them. And those were his experiences. In addition to this very poor upbringing, um, farm life as a child, he was also at one point uh, homeless himself because he was a runaway teenager. He was literally run off the farm where he grew up by a mob of angry n white neighbors who were pursuing him because of his inappropriate, in their vision, relationship with another teenager who happened to be a, a white girl. So he was run off and he was a runaway teenager living on the streets and in the swamps of Florida for several months himself. And he was, that was his experience. And he had several other experiences like that that identified him with the people that he eventually became a champion of. The story you mentioned about him being ostracized for a relationship with a, a white woman. Was that the story at the water fountain after he returned from war, or was that another story? That's another story. That happened when he was probably 15, 16 years old. The water 
Fountain story that you are referring to was when he returned to Georgia from World War II after having fought in Germany and being wounded and spending several months in jail. He was in uniform on his way back to that same farm where he grew up. Uh, he, he changed buses in, um, uh, in a small town in Georgia, actually in Jimmy Carter's hometown. And he was on medication and needed water to take the medicine. And at that time, it was during the height of Jim Crow segregation, and the colored water fountain was broken. So he purchased a cup of coffee and poured the coffee out and then tried to lean in to the, the door on the white side of the waiting room to get some water from the white fountain. And that was when he was beat and left unconscious uh, and really left for dead. And when the local colored undertaker came to pick him up, they found that he was still alive. So he was in uniform returning from service wounded in World War II when he was beat nearly to death for transgression of Jim Crow laws to get a cup of water. Wow. Did he ever talk to you about how he felt about that experience? Yes, he did. He said that he laid in the hospital after that beating thinking that he had fought on the wrong side. So he was embittered, as were many veterans of World War II who had had seen a level of social integration and social freedom in Europe that they had not experienced at home and then came back home to the same segregated and oppressive conditions that they'd left, felt very much like he had wasted his time and nearly given his life, having fought on the wrong side. Mm. There are probably so many other people who have similar stories like that. Did he share with you any other similar type stories of discrimination that he faced? Well, another uh, situation that he often talked about was during his professional career. He went to uh, Morris Brown College, which is an HBCU in Atlanta, and got a degree in chemistry and took a civil service exam for a job with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and became one of the first research chemists in the South for the Department of Agriculture. And he thought, he said that he thought that he had really made an achievement and that he had made it there. Um, and, but when he got there, he realized how limited his experiences had actually been and his preparation, but he did remedial um, work with one of the other chemists there. But he eventually came to realize that he was sort of the spook who sat by the door, the token, and that when other blacks came to tr try to get work at the lab where he was working, he was, he was always put up as the one, well, we have Jose Williams. So he was not only discriminated against in terms of his inability to move in terms of his mobility in his job, but he saw himself as being a barrier being put in the face of other blacks who came for any kind of job, menial or otherwise. Mm. Make the connection to the Southern Leadership Christian Council and his relationship with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, he worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference for several years, and that came about based upon his role in the local civil rights movement in Savannah, Georgia, where he worked for the Department of Agriculture. And he became interested and involved um, the, an incident that he attributes his involvement there to was um, having gotten this middle class mobility to, an, to the extent of having a good salary that afforded him the ability to purchase a nice home, build, build a new home for his family, and to have new automobiles and live a middle-class lifestyle, that one of the things that they would do on Sundays that was that he would take my two little brothers and they would go to a drugstore that had a, what's called, was called then a soda fountain, 
and get ice cream and that would be part of the Sunday um, treat for dessert. And it was one, one of those places that had stools that you could sit on at the counter. And this particular Sunday, there were several children spinning around on the stools, and the boys wanted to do the same thing. And he said it was very disturbing to him that he had to, given all of his success and all of his hopes and dreams for his children, that he had to tell his boys that they could not engage in something as simple as what those other children were doing. And that that was devastating to him that he realized that no matter what his achievements had been, that the future of his children were limited by these laws. So he then became involved in the local movement in Savannah through the NAACP and was actually rejected, ejected from the NAACP because of his militancy and his thoughts of taking on nonviolent direct action, which was not what was on the agenda at that time. And so he organized a group of young people in Savannah um, under the banner of an organization called the Chatham County Crusade for Voters. And they took to the streets in much the fashion of what was going on in several other places in the South, such as Birmingham, and did direct action demonstrations. And he was arrested there and spent 39 days in jail in Savannah during the summer of 63. That was when um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference sent in, as they would in local situations, send in staff members to provide technical support and to do nonviolent training. So it was because of the success of the movement that he led in Savannah that he became uh, engaged with Dr. King, and Dr. King asked him to come to Atlanta from Savannah at the, in the summer of 64 to work there for a year doing voter registration and political education. And it was supposed to, so he took a lab, uh, he took a leave from the lab in Savannah from the Department of Agriculture, it was supposed to be for one year, but he never went back. He became fully part, fully and full time engaged in the civil rights movement from there. During his time with Dr. King, did he describe his relationship with Dr. King and his thoughts and feelings about how Dr. King was viewed? I know that your father passed away in 2000? Yes. And so he was around a lot longer after Dr. King had passed away. Um, Did he share any thoughts about the man? Well, he sincerely loved Dr. King, and the way he expressed it was that he Dr. King was not his God, but he did not know God until he met Dr. King. (laughs) And so he was very much a comrade of Dr. King's. He was a friend, and he served a, a role for Dr. King that others did not. Dr. King's used to call Hosea Williams his Castro, and that was meant that he, his role was to be the agitator to be the grassroots person, to be the person who could take a field staff of young men and women into a community that had already decided they wanted to do something about the local situation and provide them with the tactical support and the organizing support and the encouragement to mount a local movement and to literally turn people out into the streets with the goal of filling up the jails in that community in order to bring about a level of pressure that would then put them in a position for negotiating demands. And the person who would come in to do the negotiating would usually be Andrew Young. And then Dr. King's role was to heighten the community's awareness and the community's participation and with the long, with the overall goal of being addressing and redressing conditions in the local community. Much has